Well, good afternoon. Welcome, family, church family, and friends to Ancient of Days. We're going to open up in two songs of worship. So just join me in worship up here and just lift your hands up to the Lord and give him a shout of joy for this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's no grace. 
Thank you, Lord. Father, you are God, and you're so worthy to be praised. So we come here today, Lord, gathering in your name, the name of Jesus Christ, to receive a word for you today, a renewing of our spirit, Lord, a freshness, Lord, of spring waters, Father, running within our spirits, Lord, to continue to keep our eyes on you, Father, to be focused on you, Lord Jesus, and to continue every day, Father, just to praise you and give you honor and grace, Lord. And we thank you and all the people in the house said, Amen. 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 All glory, then the church says amen. You know, before we get started, let me share a few words with you that are watching on Facebook Live and our family uh, friends at Lighthouse Family Church in Galveston, Pastor Ernesto, great message, we love you. You know, I am so blessed to have an evening service because this morning I was filled with such beauty, such great, inspiring words of men of God that are just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and man, I'm just filled up. So before we get started, let's pray. And as we're getting ready to pray, I want you to turn to Psalms 106. Psalms 106. Father God, as those that are watching, Lord, we thank you, Father God. And Lord, we thank you, Father God, that your spirit is upon our land this evening, Father God, as it was this morning, Lord. We thank you for all the word that is going forth, the seeds that are being planted, those that are being touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just can't thank you enough, Father God, for as we get ready to go into the Psalms, Lord, it says that your love endures forever and we understand that father god and we yearn for that and we just ask father god that we as your children continue to pray because the word of god says that if we will pray and humble ourselves that you will begin to heal our land and lord as we stretch our hands to you father god and we ask holy spirit have your way with us this evening allow your word to penetrate into parts that it has never been Allow any darkness within our lives be illuminated by the light, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And most of all, Father God, we just thank you for allowing us to stand wherever or sit wherever we may be. Open up our words and get ready to have an encounter with you, Father God. And Lord, I pray and I lift up those that are sick, those that are in the hospital. Lord, we know, Father God, that your name, Jehovah Rapha, is the healer, not only of our bodies, Father God, of our minds and our souls and our spirit. Lord, we ask that we decrease so that your word may increase in us this evening. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and read through the whole Psalms 100 and verse 6, but we're only going to go through 1 through 23. So let's go ahead and read Psalms 106 all the way through. Praise the Lord, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praises? Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O oh Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. O oh, visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefits of your chosen one that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitudes of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. That he might make his mighty power known, he rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words, they sang his praise, they soon forgot his works." They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and they tested God in the desert, and he gave them the request, but sent leanness into their soul. 
When they envied Moses in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the faction of Abraham. A fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up by the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and they worshiped the molded image. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot their savior who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hands in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves by Baal Prior and ate sacrifices made of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. Then Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stopped. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses on the account of them, because they rebelled against his spirit, so that he spoke rashly with his lips. They did not destroy the people concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood of their sons and daughters. Whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood, thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people, so he abhorred his own inheritance, and he gave them into the hand of the Gentiles, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times he delivered them, but they rebelled in their counsel, and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitudes of his mercy. He also made them to be pitied by all who carried them away captive. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from amongst the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. You know, this is a very beautiful verse for me as I've been studying it. And as we get ready to go verse by verse, I want to share that this verse talks about God's unbroken correction. And not only his unbroken correction, but his love, kindness toward the people and God's faithfulness. And that's what we are beginning to see this evening is not only his love, kindness, but his faithfulness to us, his children. See, this psalm is the dark counterpart of the predecessor. And what do I mean by that? A shadow cast by human self-will struggles against the light. And that's the problem that we have this evening is the self-will that God has given us. If it's not walking in the light, it is walking in the darkness. So I love the way the psalmist starts off this psalm. And the church says, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. What a beautiful way to start your praise off, by saying, praise you, Lord. See, the psalmist begins by giving praise because of God's many gifts. And that's what I'm going to get you to understand. The title of this message is, His Love Endures Forever. And when we begin to praise the Lord, we are praising him for his many gifts. And not only did he bless Israel in the time of exile out of Egypt, he is blessing us here this evening. He blessed us this morning with men going forward and giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we cannot be quick, church, to forget the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. The blessings that happened a year ago, a minute ago, 
10 years ago, we have to go back to God's mercy, to his love kindness. And I love what the psalmist says here. Lord, your mercy is great. And you know what? And it was always great even though the people were rebellious. So he starts off by saying, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. I had to really look at the part, oh, give thanks to you, Lord. And what am I giving you thanks for, God? And the psalmist says, this is like a sense of pleading coming from the psalmist writing this. He's saying, oh, give thanks to the Lord. See, the psalmist was desperate to make the people understand that God is merciful, that God is love kindness. Because he starts off by saying, I praise you, Lord. And then he goes on to say, I give thanks to you. And see, the psalm begins with the praise unto the Lord. See, every generation this evening of God's people can look at this and can join with praise and thanksgiving for God. Every generation, our fathers, our forefathers, our grandparents, we can all give God praise because he is good for something. And that's what we have to do as we get into this Psalms. We have to allow all the negativity to leave because we are children of light. And we have to begin to praise him. And we have to begin to give thanks unto the Lord. And this is what the psalmist is trying to get across to the people. Saying, did you quickly forget what God has done for you? How God has provided for you? Yes, there may be obstacles in your path right now. Yes, you may be going through a storm. Yes, this may be happening, but start to give praise and start to give thanks to God because every generation up until our generation, we need to be standing in the gap and giving him praise. And it goes on to say, not only give him praise. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. See, I'm simply amazed, church, this evening as I was studying the Bible, the patience and the mercy of God toward us. Some of us are so set on displeasing God. Some of us are so set on turning away from God. Some of us are so set on doing our own thing contrary to what the word of God says. But see, as I was reading and studying, I'm like, Lord, thank you because your mercy for us endures forever. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that you have not destroyed me, even though I have been rebellious, even though I have been disobedient. And that's what came to light. And I got to say it again. I was amazed, church, how patient and mercy God has toward each and every one of us and myself included. Because it goes on to say in verse one, for he is good. Well, why is he good? See, it seems that through all the ages, people soon forgot the blessings that God has showered upon them. And a good example was the Israelites. When they came out of Egypt, they came out and they were happy to be freed from the slavery, from the bondage. But then they forgot that he was good and they began to complain. And this is what a reminder for not only me, but for you, church, is that we cannot fall away from God for he is good, not sometimes, not when we want him to be all the time. And this is why this psalm really touches my heart because it's no different from it was then when they were leaving Egypt to it is now. See, if God does not bless us right now, right here, at this time, at this minute, then we forget that he, that he is even good and we run after on trying to figure it out our own way. But no, let's get into the mindset that says, God, you are good. See, we don't need to go wandering away from God's plan and try to figure out our own solutions. We need to run to God, and that's why I'm focused on this psalm. We need to praise him, and we need to say, Lord, you are good and your mercy. And there it is, your mercy endures forever. See, verse 1, I want you to underline, his mercy endures forever. See, I believe that David was the penman in the Psalms, but it doesn't say. I believe here that he's encouraging everyone to take time out as we're doing this evening, those of you that are watching us, and just to thank God and praise him for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And see, I believe David wrote this because David was like a roller coaster. One moment he was up, he was all up in his praise, and the next moment he was flat prostrate on his face crying out to God and say, Lord, help me from my enemies. See, so I believe that David wrote this. But when I told you to underline his mercies endures forever, I want you to understand this. The rest of this long Psalms, 
that we're going to go through describes God's mercy. God's loyal covenant, church. His loyal covenant of love to each and every one of us, including myself. But it goes on. He was loyal and he was mercy to a disobedient generation, as we read in Exodus. They were very disobedient. But the word endures in Greek means hupa imo, hupa imo. And what that means, it means to remain, to stay still, to be strong, to be grounded. Hupa mino means to endure people. And this is what the psalm says that God endures. His mercy endures forever. We don't need anybody else's mercy for our lives. We don't need anybody else to remain by our side. All we need to do is to begin to praise God for his mercy endures forever. What does it mean? It means to remain. See, no matter what the situation is, no matter what we're going through, if we continue to praise God in all, good and bad, God remains because the word says that he endures for us. His mercy is there. It is showering us. It is covering us. And the next two verses, we're going to learn God's mighty acts. Let's read verses 2 and 3. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? There's a question. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praises? Another question. Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. See, verses 2 and 3 are praising God for his mighty act. So the question was in verse 2, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Think about that. In the midst of praise, the psalmist recognized that his praise wasn't enough. He, the one that wrote it, recognized that my praise isn't enough. See, God's mighty acts are so many that they are beyond description. Because of this, we can't fully declare all our praise to him. We have to remember what God has done for us. And you know a good situation and a good way to start thinking, if you're going through a hard time right now, look back on the things that God has done for you. Look back at some of the situations that maybe some of us right now, we shouldn't be here. Maybe we had a near-death experience, but God got us through. Maybe we had, we were diagnosed with a sickness, but we overcame that through Christ Jesus. See, when the devil tries to put you in a place of stinking thinking, where all you can focus on is the bad, start looking upon what God did, and that's what he's talking about here. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? In other words, who can declare all his praises? I want you to go to John 21, 25. And I want to read something for you. John 21, 25. So my question in verse 2 was, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Well, see, John wrote this scripture that really kind of just jumped out at me. John 21, 25, and I'll read it for you. And there are also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the word itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Did you see that? Jesus did so many mighty acts for his children that if they were to write books, that the books couldn't even contain it. And I'll read it again. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the word itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? And then he goes on to verse 3. In Psalms 106, it says, Blessed are those who keep justice and who does righteousness at all times. And I really focus on the word, blessed are those who keep justice. And I'm like, Lord, what does that mean, those who keep justice? In other words, those who walk in obedience to God. And that's all God wants us to do this evening, to keep justice, to obey his precepts, the oracles of his word. We need to begin to walk in obedience to God, to keep justice. There's a Greek word called justatia, justatia, which means righteousness. And that's what God wants us to be, righteous. See, but this doesn't mean that we are going to, you know, we're not going to fall short of being obedient. I understand that because we live in the flesh. 
But the difference is, as long as we don't strive to be disobedient, as long as we don't go out there and know that you're going to be disobedient and be contrary to what God wants you to do, and you say, I'm going to do it anyways. See, we all will fall short of something in our walk, but the only difference is God knows your heart. And that's a time that we have to be quick to repent and say, God, forgive me. I blew it. I made a mistake. But if you go out willfully because you have this mindset of pride saying, I have free will. I can choose to do what I want. Then guess what? This is exactly what we are. We are not justice in the sight of God's eyes. We are not righteous to him. We're like a sour grape, a sour lemon, a sour lime that when somebody puts it in their mouth, you just it just gives you this nasty taste and you make this ugly face. See, we are not children. We are to be righteous. We are to walk in justice. And verse 4 goes on to say, remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. O visit me with your salvation. So now the psalmist has made a complete U-turn and he went from Verse 3, blessed are those who keep justice, to now telling God, remember me, O Lord. See, the psalmist felt that the door was open to ask God for help. And that's what we have to do, children. If you are a new Christian, if you are a grounded Christian, if you are a seasoned Christian, whatever you may be, maybe you're not even a Christian. We are to ask God to remember us because God is the only one this evening that can give us the eternal gift of salvation and I got to say it again, the psalmist felt that this door was open as it is for us. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and I'm like, if you go to a house that does not belong to you and try your house keys to open the door, is it going to work? And they go, no, because it's not the key to that house. I go, exactly. So how can we begin to reach up to heaven and ask for our blessings that are in heaven? Because the word of God says that God will give you the kingdom to the, the keys of heaven. Meaning that you have to first be righteous in his sight and that you have to ask God, remember me, God. You know, I too need your salvation. And the word of God says that he gives you the master key that will open up any door in heaven. And I like verses four and five and write this down if you're taking notes. Verses four and five are one of the most spiritual and heavenly petitions that the devout Christian can bring to the throne of grace. And I got to say that again. Verses 4 and 5, we're going to read them. It's the most spiritual and heavenly petitions that the devout Christians, such as ourselves, can bring to the throne of grace. Go to Hebrews 4.16. And I want you to focus on the word, the throne, the, the throne of grace. So the psalmist said, remember me, O Lord. So I'm going to read something. That's going to kind of seal the deal in Hebrews 4, 16. And I'll give you some time to get there. In Hebrews 4, 16, catch this. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. See, it doesn't say let us come weakened, let us come beat up, let us come jacked up. It doesn't say that. It says let us come therefore boldly unto the throne of grace that we, us, may obtain mercy from God and find grace to help us in a time of need. See, there is no sin or there is no sickness out there that God cannot overcome. The reason why God's not overcoming some of this is because we're not allowing him to overcome them. Because as I said in verses 4 and 5, it talks about Christians can come to the throne of grace. And I read it in Hebrews. He says that if we come boldly, not if we come all beat up or whimpering or, or limping or whatever the situation, he goes, no, you come boldly unto the throne of grace and you may obtain mercy and find grace in the time that you need it the most. Amen. And the church says, amen. amen. So I told you verses 4 and 5 are one of the most spiritual and heavenly petitions. Let's read verse 4 and 5. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. O visit me with your salvation. 
that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nations, that I may glory with your inheritance. Did you catch that? Verse 4. Oh, visit me with your salvation. You know, it kind of sounds like the psalmist writing this is making a plea to God to say, I'm sick. Come to me. I need doctor's care. I'm not feeling good. Come to me. I need your care. And see, you know what? When the doctor visits, he comes and he diagnoses your problem, right? But listen, there are times when God has to come to us. And what I mean by that is either because we are beat up, either because we're just weak and defeated, God comes to us. And listen to what the psalmist says in verse 4. Oh, visit me with your salvation. And wherever you may be this evening, if you feel like you're that person who's just too weak to get up, you know, you just feel defeated, you have to cry out to God and says, you know what, Lord, oh, come and visit me with your salvation. And then verse 5 goes on to say that I may see the benefits of your chosen one. I'll stop there. That I may see the benefits of your chosen one. Three reasons I'm going to give you this evening for the requests that are given here in these Psalms. You know, consider with the honor and the glory to God. I'm going to give you three of them. But I want, I want you to understand that. That I may see your benefits. Who are those that begin to see the benefits of Christ? Who are those that begin to take part of the gift of salvation? Those who have asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart. It doesn't matter the situation or where you may be. God's not a respecter of the past. He's waiting for you to make that declaration and say, God, come and visit me with your salvation. And as you welcome God into your heart, he understands that now you become one of his chosen one. Because the psalmist said it in verse 5, that I may see the benefits of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nations. See, he made it personal. He didn't say that you may see. He said that I may see. And we have to understand that when we come to Christ, we need to start to cry out to him, start to praise him. And when we feel defeated and weak, ask Jehovah Rapha, which is a healer, to come and to visit us with the gift of salvation. And he says that I may see your benefits of your chosen one. So I told you I was going to give you three things on what these, this verse meant. Number one, where he says that I may see the benefits, catch this. Lord, I want to see your people blessed by your mighty works towards them. When's the last time that the Christian has said that I may see the benefit of my prayers, that I may see every time that I get up and nobody's around and I begin to pray for people. Lord, that I may see. In other words, what he's saying is, Lord, I want to see your people blessed. By your mighty works towards them. Never did he say by my mighty works. Because that will never happen. He says I want to see. Every time that I went to church. Every time that I cleaned the restroom. Every time that I was behind the scenes. Nobody needed to recognize me. But Lord you recognize me. Because I made it all possible. For people to come into the house of God. And sit down and hear a good word. See the church needs the servants. The church needs those that say. You know what I don't. I don't want to be recognized. I don't want to be applauded by man. I don't want to be recognized by man. I want to do whatever you tell me to do so that I can begin to see the benefits of everything that I'm doing behind closed door. And not only will you see the benefits, it goes on to see you begin to see people blessed. Because they come into a church that is ready to go. They're able to sit down. And the pastor doesn't have to worry about anything. But coming to the pulpit in prayer. And giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the pastor should not be running around. To the right, to the left. Trying to make sure that the church is ready to go. No, we need servants. Those who stand behind the scenes. And say, Lord, I am doing this. So that I may see the benefits. So that I may see those who come and become to be blessed in the name of Christ Jesus. And then number two, that I may rejoice. The psalmist says that I may rejoice. In other words, Lord, I want to share in the joy with your blessed and your redeemed people. See, when we begin to rejoice, church, it's not when we begin to complain because complain brings nothing but division. 
Complain brings nothing but destruction. But when you say, I began to rejoice, I've seen people who are battling cancer say, I rejoice in you, God. And you kind of wonder, say, why aren't they angry? Why aren't they mad? No, because they understand that their healing does not come from a doctor. It does not come from man. It comes from you, Lord, that I may rejoice. In other words, Lord, I want to share in the joy with your blessed and your redeemed people. And that's what we need to begin when we rejoice. You know, when the world doesn't acknowledge what we do in church, or maybe the pastor doesn't say thank you enough, that's not the key. That's not what we're trying to get to. It doesn't matter if they tell you thank you. It doesn't matter if they acknowledge you. God already does. And when God begins to acknowledge you, you rejoice in what you do unto the Lord because what you do unto the Lord brings others closer to him. And then number three, that I may glory, that I may glory. I'm going to go back to verse five before I go to number three so I don't lose you. That I may see the benefits of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation. And here's number three, that I may glory with you with your inheritance. What is the psalmist saying that I may glory? In other words, he's saying, Lord, I want to be part of your victory and the victory of your people. See, no matter where we're at, the enemy has not contained us. No, even though he thought he shut down the house of God, little did he realize that the building was never the house of God. We are the church this evening, and he was even able to shut us down because when we could not go into the building, we came into our homes, into our offices, into our living rooms. And you know what? Our focus was not on the building. It was focused on giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people. And how many people have now come to social media watching Message after message, scripture after scripture on social media. You know why? Because now they have a hunger. They are yearning. And you know what? Because we have continued to persevere, that we have continued to go forward. Now we're allowing the airways to saturate people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That I may glory, the psalmist says. In other words, I want to be part of your victory, God, and the victory of your people. When's the last time, Christian? You say, I am a Christian saved by grace because I want others to be saved by grace. There is nothing in this world that can cause me to stumble. There is no situation that can cause me to get angry. There is no situation that I should be in fear of because the Bible says that we are not given the spirit of fear. But you know what, Lord? Instead of that, I want to glory in your name because your name is above every other name. I want to glory. And as I begin to glory in your name, those who have no hope, those who have gone astray, those who come back to the church, they too can begin to glory in your name. As we all glory in your name, God, guess what? We have victory. And not only do we as individuals have victory, God's people have victory. So go to verse 6 of Psalms 106. And he goes on to say, we have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, and we have done wickedly. And this one really got me because we have sinned with our fathers. And talk about digging into commentary after commentary and just asking God to pray. So Lord, give me, give me some nuggets, not that come from me, but give me something, Father God, so I can present to your people. And you know the crazy thing about it is, people don't realize how difficult it is to be a pastor because we are the guarders of the sheep. We guard the sheep and we have to feed the sheep and we have to nurture the sheep. And that's why when we present a message, we can't just come and say, okay, the Bible says be ready in season and out of season. No, we have to study. We have to dig deep. We have to pray. We have to fast. We have to do things that most people, other Christians aren't willing to do. Why? Because we don't want you to settle for a pork chop when you can have a filet mignon. Does that make sense? Verse 6, we have sinned with our fathers. The psalmist acknowledged the perpetual sinfulness of Israel. This is what he's talking about, including that of his own generation, because he goes on to say, we have sinned with our fathers. So he's looking at the sin, the continued sin of Israel, but he's also looking at his present generation, and there is no difference. Catch this. The psalmist is confessing his sins before the father. He is also saying that his ancestors have sinned and were forgiven. See, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? We praise him for that. We Christians are forgiven of all our iniquity. 
Not even one person aside from Jesus has ever lived on this earth perfect. We understand that. But the only difference is there's a difference between falling and habitual. Habitual means that you continue to do it because you want to do it. Falling just means that you trip over something, you fall on your face, but you get back up and you repent. And this is what he was telling me. Our hope tonight in Jesus. Why is our hope in Jesus? Because he took the sins from us, from a sinful generation, and he traded it for righteousness. And God began to clothe us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I got to say that again. He took the sins that did not belong to him, the sins of his generation, to the sins of our generation. And what did he do? He traded it in for his righteousness. And then God began to clothe us in righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. So there, right there, is victory, people. And we have to remember that God is the one that gives righteousness. When the enemy says that you are sinful, that God doesn't love you, I'm here to tell him, no. He took my sin and he clothed me in righteousness. We have all sinned with our forefathers. And i got to make you understand this. Our fathers. See, the father's sins are often reflected on the children. And I understand that. And I'll give you a story because I come from, counting back this morning, six generations of alcoholism. And I was a sixth generation, and thanks be to God because of his mercy and his grace that I'm no longer an alcoholic. But see, I was a sixth generation of alcoholism. My dad passed away of alcoholism. His dad, dad. Dad, dad, and generations and generations. So those sins were passed on to me as a child. And I got to say that again. The father's sins are often reflected in their children. That is why it is so important this evening that we break the cycle, church. That is why it is so important that we break that generational curse. And someone came up to me and said, there is no such thing as generational curse. Well, it's all in the book of Psalms. It's in the word of God. So there must be something that exists. See, in Deuteronomy 5, verse 9, chapter 9, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9, and I'm going to read it to you. Just write it down. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. It says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Did you catch that? I'm going to read it again to you. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am jealous, God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation to those who hate him. That's just one scripture about a generational curse. And that's why it's important that you watch it. If you're not walking according to God's word, you need to make a decision this evening. And that decision needs to be, oh, Lord, I'm going to surrender my arm to you, but my leg and my other arm are going to continue to do what I want. No. You know what? The Bible talks clearly about that. You're either hot or cold, people. You either choose to serve the enemy and serve him well, or you choose to serve God. But you cannot be in the middle. And the Bible says that is lukewarmness. And if you are lukewarm, what does the Bible say? That he will vomit you, or in other word, he will spew you out of his mouth. See, it sounds unfair for God to punish children for the sins of their father. Do you agree? Yes, I agree too. It sounds very unfair for God to punish the children for the sins of their father. However, there is more than, there is more than that to this thing. The effects of sin are naturally passed down from one generation to the next. When a father has a sinful lifestyle, his children are likely to practice the same sinful lifestyle. And that's where we get the word generational curse. Let me share something with you. And I didn't expect to go there, but I'm going to go there. You know, a lot of things that are plaguing our young men and our men this evening, especially now that we have plenty of free time, and I'm just going with what the Holy Spirit tells me to go, we're in front of our computers. And there are two things we can be doing right now on our computer. We could be looking up scripture. We could be looking up on how to become a better Christian. Or we could be looking at the pornography websites. 
And let me tell you something. That is a curse that we can pass down to our children. You know, when a man sits in front of a computer and looks at pornography but says, I'm doing it, but I don't expect my children to do it. Let me tell you, that's a lie. Because all it takes are those little eyes to come down the stairs at 1 in the morning when you think everybody's sleeping and you have the computer on one end of the house and you're looking at this junk and those little eyes see that which you're looking at and then the enemy uses that to burn a photograph in his memory and that's what this is talking about people when a father practices a sinful lifestyle there's a very high possibility that his children are going to follow in his footsteps and the church says amen. amen and if that's you it's okay because God is a forgiving and a merciful and graceful God and we're going to get that right at the end of this service let's jump down to verse 8 Nevertheless, he saved me for his name's sake. Underline that. Nevertheless, he saved me for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. Wow, what a beautiful scripture. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. We learned last Wednesday that God's word is above his name, and we've learned that. We read that. And now he goes on to say, you know what, my name's sake. Nevertheless, he saved them through his namesake. The psalmist acknowledges that the perpetual sinfulness of Israel, including his own generation, that in other words, he's saying, you know what, I acknowledge this, I see it, I see it happening. And he goes on to say, I'm sorry, I, I jumped the verse there. Verse 8, nevertheless, he saved them from his namesake. What is his namesake, church? It's the glory and the reputation of God. That he provided for the highest motive of his action. I got to say that again. What is God's namesake? It's the glory and the reputation of God that he provided for the highest motive of his namesake. See, the marvelous thing to me is that he saved them even when they were rebellious. The same way that he saved me even when I was rebellious. And there was a time that I didn't even have faith in him or faith in myself. But I walked into a church. I heard the word coming from the pulpit. The Holy Spirit began to show me things that were so deep inside of me, that were so dark, that I had to make a choice. I could have walked back out of there and went back to my sinful nature, but I didn't. I didn't even have faith in the person that the pastor was talking about. I just opened up my heart to allow the Holy Spirit to touch me, and then I went forth. And God saved me even with the little faith or the no faith that some of us have. See, Israel's history had this. Their history was, was, was all about the mercy of God. Because one moment they're thanking and the next moment they're building a golden calf. Because Moses didn't come down from the mountain quick enough. And that's the same thing it is with today. Maybe the pastor doesn't say hi because he's got other things on his mind. And that's your excuse to say, I'm not going back to that church. Because the pastor didn't acknowledge me or the people didn't say hi to me. And that's exactly what was happening in the day of Israel. That you know what? They left Egypt out of bondage and slavery being whipped. And because God was not continuing to provide for their flesh, they didn't need him. See, God is very patient. God is very loving, but God is also very just. His namesake, you know that the Lord is very jealous and he guards his name with honor, church. It shall never be said of him that he cannot or will not save his people. And if anyone tells you that, that's a lie because God is saving his people and he will save his people. But you know what? He cannot abate, catch this, the haughtiness of a defiant Christian or a defiant person. He will not abate that. He will not debate your haughtiness. And you know what? If you want to be defiant, God's not in that. And God won't be part of that. Now, God will be standing on the side waiting for you to humble yourself and call out to his name. But if you think because you're prideful and you're haughty that God's going to be walking alongside you, no. And this is another thing that God touched my heart. We need to allow this old memory that we have to leave us, to depart from us, because it always takes us back to a place when we start all over. See, God begins to move in our lives. God begins to change things. God begins to open up doors, but the first sign of trouble, we allow that old mind to go back to its familiar places, and we eliminated everything that God has done for us. We forgot about everything that God has done for us, and we remember the negativity 
And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying, that he's a very jealous God and he guards his own name and honor. Let's jump down to verse 12. Then they believed his word and they sang his praise. See, after they let go of the haughtiness, the abate, you know, just the, the pridefulness, they began to believe his words. And what did they do? When you begin to know that God is for you and not against you, you begin to give him praise. They believed his words and sang his praise. See, Israel's reaction to God saving work was not all rebellion and disobedience. We understand that because we read some of Exodus. It wasn't all rebellion and disobedience. There were times where they trusted God's word and they praised him in song. And that's what we are in the book of Psalms. It's about singing praise unto the Lord. Praise and thanksgiving were plentiful at the Red Sea. Can you imagine the crowd and the multitude when the enemy was coming at them from the rear and all of a sudden all they could see in front of them was a Red Sea and that old way of thinking went back to saying we should have just died in Egypt but God says no I'm getting ready to perform a miracle over your foes, over your sickness, over your enemies, over anyone that comes against my children and see they were going back to there were more graves in Egypt why didn't we just die there than die out here in the wilderness and Moses through the grace of God and through the might and power of God parted the Red Sea catch this and the children began to walk. Not only did he part the Red Sea, people, he made the ground dry so that they weren't walking in mud, muck, and mire. Have you ever walked in what we call here in New Mexico? There's a word called caliche, which is clay and mud. And if you step on that, you're going to take a wonderful slide. You're not even able to walk on that. But see, not only did God part the Red Sea, he says, I'm going to go above and beyond that. I don't want my children walking in muck and mire no more. I don't want them walking in their old familiar ways. I'm going to tell the ground and command the ground because I have dominion over it to dry up. And as they walk through, what happened? Here comes Egypt, the chariots, the soldiers, and their goal was to destroy God's children. And what happened? He closed the sea and the word says not one of them, not one of them survived. Verse 13, after they began to praise him, verse 12, I got to take you there again. They believed his words and they sang his praise, right? So now we know they're praising him, but what does verse 13 say? They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. You see how slick the enemy is? We go from praising him because the things are good. Oh, you get on the computer this morning and all of a sudden your stimulus check is in the mail. It's, it's been deposited and you're like, excuse me. Oh, God, I praise you. And then the next thing you know what it's spent, it's gone. The bills have taken it. And then verse 13 says they soon forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel. Let me explain that to you. Israel moved quickly from faith and celebration of God to disobedience. Their lust after physical material things were all that they lusted for. They forgot about the Red Sea being open. They forgot about the ground being prepared so that they could come through. They went from praising to disobedience. I'm going to ask you something, and you may get angry at me, but that's okay. Because when we preach the word of God and the Holy Spirit tells us to go, the church will be saying, go, pastor, preach it. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you something. Is it that way with you? Because at one time it was that way with me. I went from praising him to being disobedient to him. I'm going to ask you the question again. Is it that way with you that are watching us this evening? That you have gone for praising him? I even had a person tell me, Oh, yeah, I got the stimulus check. Praise be to God, but I want another one. I'm like, well, guess what? It was money that you didn't even have, right? It was money that wasn't even available to us. I'm almost ready to close, but I want to share this with you. See, you see God's miracles, but at the first sign of opposition, you forget what God has done for you, church. You saw his miracles. You saw the Red Sea, but then the first sign of opposition, you forget what God has done for you. 
and you begin to rebel against him. And all you can tell him is, I have a painful life, Lord. My life is painful. If you love me, why do you do this? God loves you. And God's not doing it. It's our free will and some of our choices. But God is ready to get you out of certain situations. All hurry. And then it says they lusted exceedingly. See, when God saves you, we begin to sing praise to him. But we can't forget his deliverance, people. So they lusted exceedingly. The word lust in Greek, and I'm going to mutilate this, is epithumia. Epithumia which means yearning for, longing, having a desire, having a craving. And it's often a negative quotation. We understand that connotation. We know that. It's to yearn, to, to long for. See, the devil wants us to long and to yearn for the things of this world, but God says, no, they're not yours. I got something better for you. And then verse 14 says, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and they tested God in the desert. See, Write this down in Psalm 78, 18. It says this, and they tested God in their heart by asking for food of their fancy. They tested God for asking for food of their fancy. See, the psalmist in verse 14 says this. You know what? Yes, at one moment we're testing God because we want what the flesh wants. The same way the Israelites did. You know, they tested God with their unbelief. And they even doubted his ability to provide for their needs in the wilderness when they saw everything that God did for them. And verse 15 goes on to say, and he gave their requests, but sent lenience into their soul. This is what I want you to catch as we get ready to close. He gave them their request in Psalms 106, verse 15, but sent leanness into their soul. What does that mean? See, God affords us great means for our increase. You know, God gives you so much and he provides so much for you. But the only difference is he will even put you by green pastures full of nutrients and full of nutrients for the body and, for, and, and, and by a running river. But not here in this case. He said he gave them the request. Instead of giving them the fat of the lamb, he began to give them lack of the fat of the lamb. A good uh, Psalms to read is Psalms 23. Talks about that. You know, therefore it is a shame for God's people not to grow and not to bring forth fruit. See, we understand that the prodigal son and Lot are two examples in the Bible where they received what they wanted, but it began to ruin and destroy them. And then the last verse that I close in, we talked about all this disobedience, but I'm going to give you something. As we get ready to close in worship, and I'm going to come back up. Verse 23 seals the deal. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away the wrath, lest God destroy them. There was a Moses that stood in the breach, and that's why, Christians, it is very important for you this evening to stand in the breach of those who are lost, those who are defeated, those who have no strength, those who have lost hope. Because what does the word breach mean? Breach means that it is a wall. It's a military term, meaning that it's a wall. And what it did is it gave an area where the enemy couldn't penetrate. They stood in the breach of the wall, willing to give his life towards a coming enemy. Are you standing in the breach? Are you standing in the part where God wants you to stand because there's some family member that needs you? Well, if that's you, let's worship God with this song, and then we'll come up and close the service. i 
as we just close in prayer. You know, there was a poll that was given a couple of days ago. They say that the average American has the attention span of three seconds. And if it doesn't catch their eye, they'll just switch to another page. But that's not us this evening, Lord. Because in verse 23 of Psalms, it says that God chose a chosen one. And that chosen one is probably sitting out there watching this video. Maybe you have not been walking with God. But see, God chose you and he told you from before the earth was even founded, before you were even in your mother's womb. Why? 
Because as Moses was the chosen one to stand in the breach, you might be that chosen one this evening to stand in the breach of your family and your children. And if that's you and you have not been walking in God, you have not been honoring him, it's okay. Because this is the most important part of the service. All you have to do is just surrender. Say, Lord, I heard the message. And Lord, I know that you were speaking to me. And Lord, I know, Father God, that I have been disobedient, Lord. And then one moment I'm praising you, the next moment I'm being disobedient. But no longer do I want to chase after that lustfulness, that desire, Lord. Because the word says you are a jealous God. Lord, I want to chase after you. Lord, I ask you this evening, as the service ends, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. And if that's you that said that, let me share with you, if you allow God to take away the hurtful past, not only will he take it from you, he will begin to make it your testimony so that you can share the mercy and the grace. And not only that, maybe you are the Moses that are going to stand in the breach of whatever God has for you. I love you, and we will be praying for you, especially those that have surrendered themselves this evening. Why? Because God loved me just as much as he loves you. We'll see you Wednesday. God bless.